Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Rahmat Budiman, the AOE Secretary General, and I would like to announce the winners of the AOE Awards 2021. We all have been waiting for this moment, and we are as excited as you are in knowing who have won the much coveted Young Innovator Award, Best Practice Award, and Best Purple Award, with one gold medal, two silver medals for each category. And of course, the most importantly, we will find out the winner of the prestigious award, AOU Meritorious Service Award. Let's start with Young Innovator Award. As we know, the Young Innovator Award goes to young, energetic, less than 40 years old scholars. Each year, the Young Innovator Award goes to individuals whose papers show quality, relevance, uniqueness, and success and impact of innovation to the theory and practice of open and decent learning. This year, we have one candidate for the Young Innovator Award. The only paper was evaluated by the adjudication committees. Three appointed persons as the adjudication committees were the chair, Professor Kandar Padas, Vice Chancellor at Krishna Kanta Hindikwi Open University, India. The members are Professor Ok Tai Kim, Professor at Departments of Media, Arts and Cultural Content, Korea National Open University, Dr. Yosef Sabah, Assistant Professor at Al Quds Open University, Palestine. Ladies and gentlemen, let me now announce upon this assessment. It has been decided that the Silver Medal of the AOU Young Innovator Award 2021 is bestowed upon Mr. Kamran Mir from Alama Iqbal Open University, Pakistan, for his paper titled Development of H5P Interactive Video Content in Moodle to improve the learners' engagement in online learning. Congratulations to our sole winner of the Young Innovator Award. We hope to motivate you and every young academician to produce and contribute more of the ODL works and follow the footsteps of Mr. Kamran Mir in the future. The silver medalist will be granted a certificate, a plaque and cash award of 250 US dollar. Now let's find out the winner for the best practice award. This award goes to the paper that shows significant practice developed to improve process, method, and show potential for such practice to be replicated and other institutions may adopt leading to the betterment of ODL practice. This year, the adjudication committees of this award comprise of the first, Professor Alan Tate, Emeritus Professor of Distance Education and Development at the Open University UK as the chair. The second, Professor Ho Sung Wo, Professor at Department of E-Learning Korea National Open University, and the third, Professor Yosef Abuzir, Professor at Al Quds Open University, Palestine, as the members. For your kind information, there are six out of 11 papers which are shortlisted for this award. And here are the authors of the six shortlisted papers.
the silver medalist for the best practice award goes to and the gold medal for the best practice award goes to Congratulations to all the winners of the Best Practice Award. The gold medalist will be granted a certificate, plaque, and cash award of 500 US dollar, while the silver medalist will be granted a certificate, plaque, and cash award of 250 US dollar. Now let's move on to the best paper award. We also have the best paper award, which goes to individuals whose paper has relevance of content to the theme and sub-themes of the conference and have a significant contribution to the ODL. The adjudication committees for this award were Professor Lee Kam Cheo, Director of Research at Open University of Hong Kong as the chair, while the members are Professor Siti Aisha Hashim, Professor at Open University Malaysia, Dr. Zahid Majid, Director of Academic Planning and Course Production at Alama Iqbal Open University, Pakistan. Six out of 12 papers are shortlisted for this award, and here are the authors of the six shortlisted papers. The silver medalist for the best paper award goes to and the gold medal for the best paper award goes to Congratulations to all the winners of the Best Paper Award. Keep pouring your ideas into valuable writings, and we are always looking forward to more of your masterpieces. The gold medalist will be granted a certificate, plaque, and cash award of 500 US dollar, while the silver medalist will be granted a certificate, plug, and cash award of 250 US dollar. Finally, the most awaited of all, the prestigious AAUU Meritorious Service Award. It has been the tradition of the AAUU to recognize outstanding individuals who have made significant and lasting contribution to the field of distance education and open learning through AOU, Meritorious Service Award, or MSA. Three appointed persons who were also the receivers of the past AOU Meritorious Service Award was chosen this year. They are Professor Tian Belawati, former rector at Universitas Serbuka as the chair. And the members, Professor Wei Yuan Zhang, former head and chief researcher at Space University of Hong Kong, who is currently working at Beijing Normal University. And Dr. Nafid 
A. Malik, founder and former rector at Virtual University of Pakistan, who currently works for Commonwealth of Learning. Ladies and gentlemen, I am very pleased to inform you that this year we have received quite many nominations for this award. There are 17 candidates of the AOU Meritorious Service Award 2021. It was not an easy task to evaluate so many talents and inspiring persons, but every single document we receive has been evaluated thoroughly by the appointed adjudication committees. After rigorous process of the assessment, I hereby announce the winner of the AOU Meritorious Service Award 2021 goes to Professor Dr. Melinda de la Peña Bandalaria from the University of the Philippines, Open University or UPOU. Professor Dr. Melinda de la Peña Bandalaria has served in the Open and Decent Learning or ODA sector as an academic leader in the University of the Philippines for today. Thanks to all nominators who have sent us nominations for the AOU MSA this year. We are truly grateful for the excitement from our member this year. Therefore, now I would also like to show you all more inspiring persons from the AOU MSA nominations who are in the top of 10. Please check and enjoy.
Okay, thank you. I'm sorry for uh, a bit delay. There was uh, an announcement through the loudspeaker. I'm afraid that the, the voice will interrupt my opening uh, remarks. Well, uh, first of all, I would like to uh, say a good morning and welcome to the AOU webinar, the student inspiration, the second. And uh, our today topic is employability. Uh, I would like to uh, say hello to uh, distant learning practitioners, enthusiasts, lecture staff, and students. And also with us, uh, the moderator and also the outstanding speakers. Once again, I would like to thank you for joining, for accepting our invitations. I'm, we are very uh, sure that you must be very occupied uh, lately. Well, uh, without delay, uh, delaying any further moment, I would like once again to welcome you to the, uh, uh, the second student inspiration. Uh, we are convinced that this time, the topic is very interesting because it uh, relates to employability. Uh, it, in many cases, as I am sure you are aware that distance, le distance learning students are, in some cases, are regarded as uh, second-rate uh, education uh, graduates, which uh, they, some people think they, they cannot compete with uh, 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 students who graduate from conventional university. But in practice, there are many evidence that distant learning uh, students graduates can compete with uh, uh, other students from con uh, conventional university, including accepted by uh, outstanding, uh, uh, what's that, um, uh, uh, employment, and also they can create their own uh, employment. Well, uh, once again, thank you. And then uh, because we are running out of time, I would like to invite the presidents of the AOU, Professor Ojat Darojat, to deliver uh, the opening remark. Time is your Prof. Ojat. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Rahmat. <clears throat> uh, hello, good uh, morning, everyone, ladies and gentlemen. So uh, we meet again today on the second episode of AOU webinar. Uh, students' patients. Of course, for, first of all, I would like to give my warmest hello to our distinguished speakers today, uh, Professor Chengis Hakan Aydin from Anadolu University, Turkey, and also Mr. Kamran Mir, alumni from Alama Iqbal Open University Pakistan, and then Miss Angelina Chong, alumni of Wawasan Open University Malaysia. And of course, the most important role of our webinar today, Miss Ethel John Atense from Siamio Inote, Philippines. And our registers uh, have taken some time this morning to join our uh, program. So welcome to you all. Uh, I'm delighted to finally here again with you. <clears throat> and I hope everyone is doing well and safe during the COVID-19 outbreak. This time, ASEAN ASEAN of Open University introduced a new concept of webinar where we invite speakers, both from lectures, practitioners, and also students or alumni as well uh, of the AOU members institutions with the expectations to share ideas and recent experiences, motivation, and also knowledge from different perspectives, especially for those who have just uh, started to jump in open and distant learning in field. 
under the theme we've been today, employability, we will see how much uh, good chances of ODL based institutions, especially learners or alumnus, have in their professional career world. It is very important, as I've already uh, said by Mr. Rahmat, that uh, the alumni from open universities have to be regarded as uh, secondary education. Uh, there are still doubt, tendencies in regard to the capability of alumnus of an ODL universities on performing their jobs compared to those who graduate from conventional universities. Uh, by the experiences that will be shared by Mr. Kamran Mir and Ms. Angelina Chong, we will witness how we are still capable to compete in uh, career-wise. While from uh, Professor Hakan Aydin, we will listen and learn how this employability issues, uh, especially in Turkey and his institution, Anadolu Open University. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, keep yourself started. I hope we will be shared by our keynote speakers today. Uh, would be able to apply it either by us personally and our career in our decisions, uh, we are applied to. So enjoy the discussion and please be actively engaged. I hope you could pick a benefit from our uh, webinar today and gain more uh, knowledge uh, for yourself and others. So thank you and have a good day uh, ahead. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, President. Uh, Professor Rajat Darujat. Well, ladies and gentlemen, there is a proverb in Indonesia which is say, tak kenal maka tak sayang. Or if it is translated into English, if you do not know the person, you will not love him or her. So, uh, to begin our uh, inspiration webinar, I would like to introduce our uh, moderator. Ms. Uh, Ethel Joan Atienza, or Joan, is a specialist for learning management and implementations at the Southeast Asian Ministers of Education Organization, <coughs> Regional Center for Educational Innovation and Technology, or Simeo Innotech. Joan has been working in the open and decent learning courses design, development, and implementation for 16 years, quite a long time. She is currently the course manager of Innotex flexible learning courses for teachers, school heads, and education personnel, as well as Innotex flagship massive on open online courses or MOOCs, teach on keeping the patient alive. Her technical competencies include educational project management, international training management, educational innovation and technology, instructional design of open and decent learning courses, adult learning and competency-based assessment. She completed her undergraduate degree in journalism from the University of the Philippines Diliment, graduating with honors. Wow. She has earned master degree unit in education, major in educational technology from the University of Philippines Diliman, major in educational management from the National Teachers College. She likes to earn a postgraduate diploma on project management from De La Salle University College of St. Benilde. Joan was a finalist in the 2021 Asian Association of Open Universities Meritorious Service Award in recognition of her contribution to the field of open and distance learning. 16 years of full experience, and I am very sure uh, our listeners today, our viewers, you will 
listen to very fruitful discussion led by Joan. Joan, time is yours and have a fruitful discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ramat Budiman. I, it, well, basically, my role for this morning is to be introducing our distinguished speakers, and I will be as much of a learner and an audience no, as our webinar participants here. I'm sure we will be learning a lot from them. I'm grateful for this opportunity to serve as moderator for you this morning. Now, to kick off our discussions, please allow me to read to you the webinar regulations, some reminders for our webinar participants. May I kindly request our technical staff to pull up our slide for this webinar regulations. Towards the end of the presentation, you will have an opportunity to ask questions to our speakers. And when you do ask the question, please do not forget to provide your name the institution you belong to, the country, and identify to which speaker you are addressing the question. So later on, during our question and answer portion, I will be reading these questions and our speakers will be responding to them. Now, for the certificate, uh, please be reminded to fill out the registration form. Make sure that you follow the full program. Towards the end of the program, you will be given a link on the feedback form, please fill out this feedback form. Your certificate will be made available on the AAOU website. So please regularly check on the website for the availability of the said certificate. Now for our first speaker, I kindly be reminded that you have 20 minutes to complete your presentation. Now, without further ado, allow me to introduce to you our first speaker. May, our, may I request our technical st staff? Thank you very much for that. Our first speaker is a senior physiotherapist at the Raja Charles Brook Memorial Hospital. She is likewise the president of the Sarawak Physiotherapy Association. Our speaker is also passionate about preserving heritage and culture. She is currently an EXCO member of the Sarawak Heritage Society. But that's not enough because our speaker is also a first Dan black belt under the International Taekwondo Federation of Sarawak. Friends, a mover, literally and figuratively, please welcome Ms. Angelina John. Ma'am, good morning. Turning over to you. Right, hi, good, good morning. Um, let me share my screen, hang on for a sec, yeah? Okay, so um, a very good morning and greetings from Borneo, the land of the headhunters. Let me know when I've reached my 20 minutes. I, I tend to like overlook the time. So um, I was given this theme, employability, and, and just to do this first slide, if you look at my first slide, just to do this first slide, there's so many things that I learned from here. First of all, look at the background. It's a blackboard. And to me, a blackboard is always synonymous with learning, which is what we are actually doing, you know, with all these um, universities, open distance learning and all. And um, if you look at the bike over there, that's me. It's, it's old. It's, you know, it's a high wheel bicycle. But why a bicycle specifically as my introduction background? Um, because I believe that life is like a bicycle and uh, you need to keep on pedaling and, um, you know, to, to keep on moving, to keep your balance. And that is how education is as well. And that is how learning is. We need to keep on learning. As long as we live, as long as we breathe, learning never stops. It's an ongoing, continuous process, which is what we are all going through at the moment. Um, and um, employability is something that I've never spoken about. And in, in, in this, you know, prior to this, I've always thought that employability means gaining um, a job, getting a job. Well, I was wrong because when, when I was given this theme, I started reading up and um, then I realized that employability is actually like gaining skills to, uh, uh, to better yourself for your current employment, uh, to develop 
positive attributes as well as well if it's possible yeah getting a new job you know but um i also read an interesting uh, argument by harvey lee in 2001 where he actually mentioned that employability is not just about gaining skills it's about a combination of experiences as well as positive attributes which uh, is gained through higher learning which is what we are doing right now at this moment and it is not a product it is actually a process of learning and um i was you know it opened up my mind and that's that's why i wanted to share this with you guys okay now that's me so i've just graduated this year i just finished um, my bachelor's of management with psychology and um, i started in 2000 mid 2017 yep i'm very very passionate about speaking out for the voiceless i believe that i should you know speak out for those that can't defend themselves um, i love our heritage and culture where i live in sarawak in borneo we have more than 26 ethnic groups and you know it's so interesting and um yeah i'm also into outdoor activities why i'm telling you this is so that i could bring you to our next you know slowly uh, bring you to our next uh, topic all right, so why study again? Um, why at this age, you know, I'm studying again? Um, well, you see, before WOU, before I became a part of WOU, um, I was a regular eight to five happy person who was working in a very comfortable uh, working environment. But out of a sudden, it was all taken away from me and I ended up in a toxic work environment if you could look at my slide you can see how toxic it is and um, it was really bad that um, you know the top management were actually very um, oppressive and they, they practice chronism and all and I was you know no matter how much I tried to speak out and uh, to make things right it would never be accepted. And I was just wondering at the back of my mind, why is such uh, oppression, why is such injustice being carried out, being performed in such a big organization so openly? And it was accepted by everyone because everyone thought that there's nothing we can do about it. But I know that something can be done and I wanted to know how, uh, but but I didn't, I didn't know at that time. And I knew that I had to learn. And and um, I knew that there was some flaw in our system and I wanted it to change. And I wanted it to start with me and, and make the first move and see how I can make things better for everyone. And that's how I decided that I wanted to study again about management. And um, which brings me to YWOU. Now, um, being a working adult, um, with a lot of things in my hands, I, I, I knew it has to be a part-time open distance learning. So what I did at that time was I went to all the um, universities that we have around here, which offered part-time courses or open distance learning courses, and WOU was one of them. So I collected all the brochures. I knew I wanted to study something about management, system management, organizational stuff. I didn't know what, but I started collecting brochures and I went through them one by one. And um, out of you know all the universities which offered management, WOU was the only one which offered management with psychology. And it you not know, it clicked because I personally, I feel that psychology is a very uh, critical element, which is very often neglected in the management process. Um, psychology is very important because it does not only um, allow us to understand why people behave the way they behave, but it also allows us to, um, to understand how we should behave. How are we going to accommodate? How are we going to be um, uh, to change our approach to different people with different attitudes and mindset? And how we are going to make use of psychological play in order to gain things towards our advantage and to create opportunities for ourselves. So these are the things which is lacking 
in our society, especially on the uh, higher authority where uh, the, the, the well-being, the psychological elements are, are being neglected. And, um, and that was why I chose BMPS in WOU. Uh, apart from that, um, I saw that there was a, a hell load of uh, flexibility being offered in the program structure. Uh, I needed something that could actually give me a work-life balance, which is what WOU was like, you know, offering. I'm also studying uh, other stuff. I'm, I'm currently, I'm doing like other degree programs with other universities as well. And I'm attending certain other courses. And because I have, I've got this addiction to studying, right? So because, because I'm studying here, I'm studying there, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. I needed time for myself and I needed a very flexible structure that would allow me to carry on with my personal life and not being affected by it. And yeah, my NGO activities, uh, I'm into a lot of NGO activities as well. And um, these are usually during the weekend. So program structure is very important for me, uh, which is what WOU has. Um, it gives me flexibility. It also has, I find when I compare to the other universities that I'm in, I find that WOU gives a lot of emphasis on learning. Uh, when you look at their module, their structure, it's, it's towards how you can guide a student to learn. Um, their assignments are not just for you to get marks, but it's actually how uh, you're going to do, perform your assignment in order for you to excel and do well. Um, so that's what, okay. So how do I study on top of my work life, my family life, my personal life, my NGO activities, my studies, my outdoors. How do I study? Well, if you could look at my slide, I cross start the study because I don't. Um, I don't study because I don't have the time to study. But what, what I do is pay attention. Pay attention during your sessions, during your classes, pay a lot of attention and always ask, no matter how annoying you are, you know, I can be so annoying by, hello, I've got a question. Uh, hi, you know, I always do that. And, and because I do that, I'm, I'm usually the famous one uh, with my lecturers and everybody knows Angie, you know? So, um, but yeah, that's my right. And I, if I don't understand, I gotta ask because if I don't understand A, I'm never gonna progress to C. So I need to know what A is first. And you know, I the, the thing is like ensure that you understand. Make sure you understand. And when you understand, you'll never forget. Find humor in what you study, make studying fun. You know, before this. COVID thing and we had to do online studies. We had face-to-face -face sessions, you know, every month. And um, at the end of every class, you know, when we, we get out of the classrooms, you know, I, I get friends who are two blocks away and they're like, Angie, um, were, were you in class two blocks away? I said, yeah, I was. How did you know? And they were like, well, we heard you. I was like, oh my God, I'm so loud. And, you know, but because everyone's laughing and um, at the end of every semester I have my classmates coming to me and saying like okay Angie uh, what, what, are, what course are you talk, uh, taking next semester what subjects are you taking and I'm like I don't know uh, why no because we want to do it with you because you know being in class with you is fun because you know when there's jokes when there's humor you remember better and it's not only for me it's actually also for those around me to study together to learn together and and it's just fun. And finally, I always ask myself, you know, when things are difficult, I always ask myself, why am I studying? What is the purpose of me studying again? I'm comfortable. I have a job that I want. I'm financially stable. I have everything that I need. But why am I studying again? And I keep on asking myself that. And I know that the reason why I'm studying is not for promotions. It's not for um, a, a pay raise. It's for internal motivations it's my internal satisfaction this is the reward I get the knowledge I get you know I could sit in a coffee shop and I could talk about management you know that kind of stuff so it's basically about me what I gain and what I know and what's inside and that is why I'm studying and when I when I when I think of that it drives me 
and it makes me you know push forward again and and that's what i like and i'm gonna you know continue it, it's a continuous process so what is the impact and the outcome of well, I finally graduated, right? So, so what, what do I see at the end of that, uh, you know, with this? Well, I find that I can manage things better now uh, in my office setting, um, where because I'm, I'm actually the head of the unit in my organization and we do a lot of management for our top authorities and how we do, um, uh, we, we are into like quality, quality screenings, we do risk management, and I think that I'm more equipped with the knowledge to manage that better. And it's I can deal with the human behavior, different types of human behavior much easier now. You know, I get difficult employers, difficult employees. Well, I'm one difficult employer, employee as well. But yeah, you know, it's, it's easier. I can understand why that person is that way. And how am I supposed to decrease that, that behavior? How am I supposed to accept that behavior? That kind of stuff. Uh, I'm more aware now of the opportunities that I have. Um, you see, being a speaker here is one very good example of you know, being aware of an opportunity. I was approached, uh, I was approached by the university and said, Angie, can you can you speak for this webinar? And I said, uh, okay. You know, I didn't know the topic. I didn't know why am I supposed, what am I supposed to speak? And I just said, okay, count me in. You see, um, you know, Richard Branson once said, when an opportunity is given to you, just grab it. Even if you don't know how to do it, just grab it and figure out how to do it later on. And that's exactly what I did. And I'm learning. So this is my opportunity. I'm creating new opportunities. And this is all from, you know, whatever that I've learned for the past couple of years. Resolving toxic workplace issues. Remember the story I told you about how and why I studied in the first place? Because I had a boss who was very difficult, who had an attitude problem, who was trying to oppress everyone. Well, yeah. At the end of it, right, from, from the, the knowledge that I've gained from studying and learning about how the management system works, you know what happened to that boss? He was transferred with immediate effect. He's not in that organization anymore. So yes, you know, that's, that's one up for me. That's my employability skills gain. And confidence. Yeah, um, well, I've always had this confidence, but I think that I think that now. The confidence is so much better with the knowledge that I have. Um, the leadership qualities are definitely there because, you know, although you have the characteristics, without essence, without the knowledge, it still does not mean much. And with those extra, it's not enough. Of course, there's room for plenty more. Um, but I think that it's building. And um, with that, you, you can actually, you can see, you can feel it and other people can see it too. And I know that uh, leadership qualities, is not just about being bossy. It's not about having the uh, given authority that you have in your hands, because I think that what I would want to do as a good leader is whatever that I'm doing now will be a legacy. And um, when one day, when I'm not around anymore, when I'm gone, I want the people that are still there to continue that legacy. And that I believe, you know, is a good leadership that people will have, will be able to have a common goal with me. Um, and that is how you see that, you know, as I'm talking to you now, I don't have a script in front of me. I have all those slides because I know I was supposed to do a slide. So I just did a slide for the sake of doing a slide, but I am the kind of person that when I speak to you, I want to speak it from my heart because then it would be more genuine. And these are the qualities that I feel that is you not know, that that are developed, um, that, that can be sharpened and heightened with knowledge. So with uh, you know, after having studied now and finished, I'm 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 more motivated, you know. I'm once I the moment I finished with WOU when I finished everything, you know, it dawned on me that I was feeling very empty. I have no more assignments, I have no more deadlines, I have no more exams, and I felt so empty and I I felt so lost. I didn't know what to do. You know, I, for the past few years I'm always on the laptop and I didn't know what to do. 
And I knew that I, I missed it. I missed that learning process. And now, although I'm still studying another program with another university, I'm, I'm also with WOU and looking at what else WOU can offer me. And I will be moving on with WOU after this. So what happens future and beyond? This is my foundation to self-development. This is the first stepping stone for me to widen my perspectives into the outside world. You know, there's so many things out there to learn. It's not just my tiny cocoon, you know, there's so many things. Um, and therefore, I know that things, my learning process will not just end here. It's not going to stop when I graduate, I'm going to do my master's, I'm going to do my PhDs. And then the best thing is, I want to come back and do my degrees again. Because I find that, you know, I find I, I'm not a paper person. I, I'm, I don't look at paper qualification. I like degree programs because degree program starts you from the very basic and you start from the bottom and you learn and, and it's a lot of coursework, a lot of, a lot of writings and learning and you learn more. And I like it. And this is, a learning process that will never end until I die. I, I do foresee myself at 91 without my teeth, with my crutches, and not getting my scroll kind of thing. So this is something that I believe in. Uh, this is a personal motto that I carry with me all these years, that if you aim for failure, you will succeed. Read that again and understand that. And, and that's all for me. And uh, I, I know it's not 20 minutes. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ma'am Angelina Jog. I myself have learned a lot from your presentation. Just please uh, allow me to just uh, share with our webinar participants some of the highlights of what I learned personally from your presentation. Number one, reflection. So you reflect a lot about you know, the things that you're doing. Everything was purposive. You're taking purposive action. And then you are in tune to the opportunities when they arise. You know, as, as you mentioned earlier, uh, you were looking at also creating balance, weaving in the quote-unquote study, which you don't call study, into your, uh, into your life. Knowing your why, very important. Uh, one of our um, previous consultants said, you lose your why, you lose your way. So never lose that why. And then that internal motivation will sustain you. Uh, later, uh, earlier, I was introduced as having been a practitioner of open and distance learning for the past 16 years. And I can tell you, internal motivation will sustain you. So for mm -hmm. our young people, mm -hmm. eventually, you will pick that up. Internal motivation will sustain you. And finally, what I noted is that with competence comes your confidence. So thank you very much again, ma'am. I'm Angelina Jong. Now, may I request again our uh, technical staff to pull up our uh, webinar regulations for the benefit of those who are just joining us at this time. Allow me to just uh, reiterate some reminders for you. Uh, later on, in the pre at the end of the presentations, you will have an opportunity to ask questions. And when you send those questions, please identify your name, the institution you belong to, your country, and identify to whom you intend to ask the question. So we will be reading them later on. Now, as for your e-certificate for your participation, please do not uh, forget to fill out the registration form. Make sure that you're following the whole program. And towards the end of the program, fill out the feedback form, the link of which will be shared after the program. The e-certificate will be made available in the AAOU website. You will have to check on the website regularly to determine whether the certificate is already available. To our next speaker, please be reminded that you also have 20 minutes to complete the presentation. Kindly expect me to, to remind you when there's two minutes left. Now to uh, introduce now our second speaker, may I request our technical staff to pull up the profile of our speaker. Our second speaker is a distinguished EdTech researcher and trainer. He is currently the IT Assistant Director of the Alama Iqbal Open University. He is also currently a PhD scholar at the Institute of Geographical Information, National University of Sciences and Technology in Pakistan. Our speaker 
has received many awards and distinctions. Among these, being a three-time Young Innovator Awardee of the AAOU. Friends, let's welcome our passionate innovator, Mr. Kamran Mir. Good morning, sir. Turning over to you. Thank you very much, uh, John, and uh, thank you very much, Angie, for the very beautiful presentation. And uh, good morning, everyone. Let me share my screen. Mm, my screen is visible to everyone? Yes, sir, we see it. Okay, thank you very much. Though uh, it is a very unique kind of uh, like presentation uh, today, uh, I was just confused what to present because uh, sharing my experience as a student, it was uh, like uh, looking like very self-centered presentation, but still I will try uh, to share my experience, especially for the upcoming students who have recently joined uh, like ODL, Open and Distance Learning, uh, just like in, in the starting of the presentation, it was uh, being told that ODL and open distance, sometimes in it is being graded as a second class or like second priority students. I think that trend was also in Pakistan. Uh, it was also the similar trend, uh, but the things are getting changed, especially after COVID. So uh, I think overall, uh, I will focus how... ODL helped me during my all the career. So starting with my uh, brief introduction, right as uh, John already told, right now I'm working in uh, one of the largest in Pakistan uh, open university uh, from past like more than eight years as an assistant director IT. And uh, I'm managing the learning management system of like, uh, we have more than like 600,000 students. And um, in the, after COVID, uh, we were like managing all the uh, online workshops and online exams. So it was a huge task. So starting with my education, uh, I have a very old relationship, open, open university. As uh, I have current right now, it's my third degree, which is still going on along with my PhD uh, with open and distance learning. And it was like when it was 2003, when I uh, completed my intermediate, uh, the college life. And uh, though my score was good, but the problem was, what was the problem? The problem was my financial uh, stability. Like, uh, you know that the regular universities are very uh, competitive. Uh, you have to get like, uh, the first restriction is the competition. You have to score a specific uh, percentage or you have to pass the exam or the second restriction is the financial restriction that the fees are not affordable for, for many so uh, i was like uh, the first part was uh, i cleared that part like i was eligible for the regular university but the problem was the financial constraint in 2003 uh, my financial uh, background was not that much enough to support the uh, the fees of the regular universities so uh, the doors of the open and distance learning are always open for such students. And those are the majority of the students like who face the financial problem, who cannot, uh, who don't have time to, uh, to participate uh, in a regular university. So the open university gave me the opportunity uh, from where I did my bachelor's in computer science. And I still remember uh, that uh, that time I had to work like uh, for uh, for whole night. I was working uh, during my bachelor's of computer science. I was working in like night jobs, like from night 12 o'clock till 8 a.m. I was working and uh, from morning, like I have uh, the opportunity to attend some classes as well. And uh, because of the flexibility of the open and distance learning, I was able to like meet my thesis and uh, I, I was like able to complete my whole bachelor's uh, with Alamai Gwalp University because of its flexibility and because of its affordable fees. And that only made it possible that uh, I was working and studying. And still, I'm, uh, I haven't left any uh, studies and job. I'm doing it parallel uh, since 2003. So what made it unique? Uh, what experience oh, I had uh, 
which was different from the regular students of the university who were studying at full time. And after four years of degree, like after passing my graduation, uh, all the students or the majority of the students whom I know who were like uh, studying in a regular university, they were not having any experience and they were still striving for the job because the problem in our education system as a whole in on an overall education system is that it, it works uh, like in a different direction uh, with industry. The industrial requirements are separate and the, the education requirements are somehow like not very correlated uh, in overall world, I think so, uh, which makes the gap uh, between the academia and industries. But if you are an ODL student and if you are working uh, along with your studies, I think that gap is very much lessened uh, as, my, as far as my experience is concerned. So when I completed my bachelor's degree, I was already having a four years of experience in a multinational, like international company. So I was already holding a good job. And still, uh, even after bachelor's of computer science, I was having a degree along with the relevant experience uh, in, of the industry, which make me more like uh, um, unique uh, with the other students who were studying in the regular university. And that was a unique feature of the ODL open and distance learning that it makes you more, uh, it gives you more confidence because you, with along with the studies, you can participate in the social activities. You can participate in your like uh, working if you want to work, especially if, if you have uh, financial constraints. So th this was the unique benefit uh, which I got from the Open University. And later on, I didn't stop. Um, this uh, again, I will link this uh, link it with the Angie's point. Like there must be a motivation unless uh, there should be a objective of the life is very important or objective of doing something. If your objective or your vision is large enough to accommodate so many things, so it will keep you like, it, it will keep you pushing to doing the things. If your objective is very small to get a job or to get a degree, so I think it will, uh, it is not very sustainable. So as a human being, if uh, I think as a student, uh, it's, a, it's a suggestion for the new students or the students who are joining the ODL system. Always keep your like broader objective of your life. Uh, again, answering the question of why uh, with John identified, why we are here in this world and what is our duty? Uh, and if we are studying anything, if you are doing any job, so what is our purpose of doing that degree? If you keep that objective in your mind, uh, especially if it is more generic, for example, in my personal, I think the objective is, should be to serve the humanity. If you are doing anything, if you're doing any job, if you're doing any studies, everything you know or any knowledge you have, it is your duty to serve the humanity, to serve your society by uh, solving the problems. So this thing will keep you motivated and uh, the same happened with me as well. And Alhamdulillah, I'm still motivated and I'm still studying with this vision that whatever we know, uh, whatever knowledge we gain, we can solve the problems of our, of our society and, uh, and we can upbring the humanity or so we can serve the humanity and, and that will ultimately satisfy your inner self. And if you are inner, innerly satisfied, you will keep struggling. So uh, that's how uh, I continued after my bachelor's. I started my master's in computer science from Open and from Open University, and again my job was also continued. And um, by 2013, I was like uh, able to get the job in the same university, and and, uh, and the getting a job in Open University was also like uh, the big. I think the factor was I was already a student of open distance learning and I already knew what are the problems uh, which are faced by the ODL students. So, and I had so many ideas, which I, in my past eight years, I implemented, um, like I worked on my own ideas as well, like by building an online support system and by creating SMS based uh, like uh, services. And recently in my PhD, I'm also working um, uh, and how I can solve the ODL student problems using GIS, like how to solve the problems using mapping technologies. So due to this, 
uh, vision in mind and due to the environment which open university gave me uh, it also gave me the opportunity to collaborate with other open universities especially uh, when in 2013 when i joined open university the ola my global open university it was hosting the 27th aou conference at that time and uh, at that time i was like introduced with the aou conference and i continuously like i tried my best to attend all the conference except few ones i missed which i missed uh, of the hong kong i think and uh, one which was in indonesia i think maybe but i continuously like participated in these conferences i continuously engaged with the relevant like uh, uh, collaborators for example i still know uh, uh, bobby from the open university of philippines i still know uh, like jimmy um, uh, whom i met in 2013 i still i'm still in contact with them i still like uh, continuously talk with them uh, working on different ideas on on how to solve the problems of odl students so uh, and it also later on gave me the opportunity to like uh, visit china shanghai open university and collaborate with uh, other nine uh, research scholars and recently i visited philippines in 2019 which gave me more further opportunities so uh, these are all the benefit these are not my personal like uh, uh, efforts i think the more credit i i will give uh, it to the open university it was the open university which uh, like gave me such opportunities to contact or to, uh, to collaborate with other open university students and other you know, open university faculty members and uh, in open university especially uh, what makes you more satisfied because you are dealing with masses once if you if you are working in a regular university and especially if you are solving the education problem of that specific university it will only solve the problem of few who are like more, uh, not more than 5% or not more than even 1 to 2% but if you are working in an open and distance learning open university or if you are studying in open and distance learning university and you are like solving the problems of open and distance learning students it will automatically satisfy you more because you are uh, solving the problem of masses in in our case like we have like 1.4 million students in in a year so ultimately in in most of the countries if you see uh, the enrollment numbers are like high as compared to the regular universities so if you solve the problems of the open and distance learning students so ultimately you are solving the problems of the masses so ultimately this will satisfy you more in your like uh, work so again i am uh, right now uh, uh, john author told i am doing my phd as well and as my phd research and my master's research was all about uh, the education especially distance education so i thought it is better to enhance my knowledge along with my phd as well so uh, and similarly this is only possible when you are studying in open and distance learning environment because we cannot study two regular courses simultaneously but in a, in an open distance learning it is uh, possible like right now i'm doing a phd in one of the like uh, regulated university which is the number one in pakistan and that is also um, uh, the uh, the credit goes to an odl student being an odl student throughout like i did my bachelor's masters from an open and distance learning student and i got admission in phd which is a regular but number one university regular number one university which uh, which is being ranked number one in pakistan and i got the admission like uh, being an odl student it is my like uh, i think the credit goes to again uh, the experience and the knowledge uh, was only possible because of the open and distance learning and so right now i'm studying my uh, ma in distance education as well so that uh, all the concept which i will use in my phd so to enhance my knowledge uh, of educational uh, like theories so it will it is uh, really helping me out so uh, this is a briefly uh, my experiences which i was working along with my studies so i was working in a private company uh, in the night shift uh, then later on i worked in another company uh, it, it was again uh, then in the night shift uh, along with my studies and then i joined uh, the government sector in uh, 20 like 10 and this is my current job which i am uh, still working since since 2013 and uh, my both like as an uh, as a student especially uh, today's presentation is from students perspective and later on i am uh, at a professional job 
both are now my correlated like uh, both are in the field of open and distance learning and my research area is again uh, the ODL uh, on which I'm working from like past uh, five to eight years and still I want to pursue the same because there are so many gaps and uh, by time every like every year new uh, technology comes and new problems you face especially after covid there are uh, there were new uh, problems which uh, our education systems were facing so now i think this is the best time for the ordeal uh, professionals or the ordeal uh, practitioners to lead the education side because uh, before covid especially uh, the distance learning was somehow somehow was graded as a secondary uh, as compared to the uh, the regular universities but after covid it uh, the covid has proved like uh, the online learning uh, can do like a magic like you can uh, by, by regular universities you cannot entertain the students like in millions but it is only possible uh, using the ordeal or the e learning technologies we can um, improve the knowledge we can increase the knowledge and especially now now is the time uh, we can train our other regular universities how they can uh, like how they can develop their infrastructure in giving the online education and how they can uh, teaching them the pedagogies of online teaching them the strategies teaching strategies which are compatible with uh, especially the online learning because our regular universities are trained enough for the face to face classes but for the online there are different techniques and there, there are different the dynamics are very different for the online uh, for the online students and for the online psychology so i think this is the time uh, to lead uh, uh, the ordeal institutions should lead the education and should train all the teachers of the regular universities as well by making the policies of online learning by making uh, different uh, training toolkits for the teachers so i think uh, this is the same again repeating the things um, as a whole if i say all about um, ordeal i think this is uh, this gives you more opportunity to to see the problems from a bigger perspective because when you are studying as a regular student and uh, you are not doing like job or other stuff you are very limited you have very limited knowledge somehow and you don't get uh, most of the time you don't get a chance to work uh, in the real scenarios and especially with open and distance learning you i think step back and see what are the problems of the society you can work for if even if you have the financial constraint or even if you don't have any financial constraint even then it gives you a more good exposure like if when you're working and you you're studying together and that is only possible in ordeal environment and when you are studying in a regular university definitely you have to attend the classes on daily basis and it is not possible to work or it is or it becomes very difficult to work so when you work studying as a an ordeal student and you're working in your relevant field of interest i think it will uh, give you maximum like exposure how you can solve the problems of a society and it give, it will enhance your uh, confidence level and it will gives you very crystal clear uh, road map uh, of your career and i think uh, that is the best way uh, and nowadays uh, now it, it's a like uh, time uh, we promote the ordeal uh, because if you see the west also now most of the regular universities they are from past like 5 to 10 years they have they have been converted to online universities just like the if you see the mit course where if you see uh, stanford university all are part are offering courses on the coursera and edx or at the moocs so in the next the patterns of uh, giving education uh, they are getting changed so especially after covid uh, we need to visionize we need to see uh, how the things are getting changed and we need to adapt ourselves accordingly uh, i think uh, that's it from my side if you uh, have any question then most of thank you very much thank you very much mr kamran mir again i learned a lot from your presentation and i'm sure also for our uh, webinar participants i just wanted to highlight some of the things that i picked up 
from Sir Tamir's uh, presentation. Number one, to be able to understand your own context. So, so in his case, he talked about uh, uh, recognizing already the stiff competition when it comes to the universities, as well as the financial requirements. And having understood that context, he proceeded to do what he called a roadmap, sort of a roadmap. So how do I go about uh, fully knowing this context? And he had this foresight that learning or studying should come with actual practice. And at the same time, you know, we often associate vision to institutions. You know, institutions have vision, but we do not normally associate a vision with ourselves. But what he pointed out was it was also important for you to have your own vision, a vision for yourself. And this vision should not only be like a personal vision, like I want to have a house in the next five years or a car or a job, but actually a vision that also has to do with your social goals. What do you want to contribute in the society? And he mentioned this, for example, to be able to serve humanity. So that is a vision that is not only a personal, but also social, you know, the social dimension of your personal vision. And with that understanding, take advantage of the opportunities presented by open and distance learning. So thank you very much, sir. We again, certainly learned a lot from your presentation. So once again, for the benefit of those who just joined us, please um, allow me to repeat some of our webinar uh, regulations. When you, have, when you want to ask a question, please do not forget to identify your name, your institution, your country, and then identify um, the speaker that you intend the question for. So later on, uh, we will be reading those questions. And then for your certificate, uh, you will have access to your certificate um, after the program. Please fill out the registration form to be able to have access to your certificate. Follow the whole program. Towards the end, fill out the feedback form, the link of which will be shared with you later. The certificates will be made accessible through the AAOU website, perhaps a couple of days or about a week after this session. So please do check the AAOU website regularly for the availability of your certificate. So now with that, uh, please, uh, now moving on to our next speaker, again, kindly be reminded that you also have 20 minutes for your presentation and uh, towards uh, the two minute time mark, please uh, expect me to give you a reminder. So our next speaker is a seasoned open and distance learning leader. May we request our technical staff, thank you very much. He is a professor of the communication sciences program at the Anadolu University in Turkey. He is likewise the coordinator of academia massive open online courses of the Anadolu University. He also serves as external evaluator of the Turkish Higher Education Quality Council. Our speaker is a prolific researcher, having published numerous researches in journals and books. And today, we are honored to have the opportunity to hear from our open and distance learning expert, Dr. Zengiz Hakan Aileen. Sir, good morning. Turning over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for this opportunity uh, for me to share my experiences. Uh, I think the more we share, uh, the more we uh, the more we help our society and uh, and everybody. Meanwhile, I try to open my presentation. I am, I I hope everybody can see it. Uh, yes, I'm. Uh, thank you for the nice introduction, uh, Joan. Uh, okay, let's see. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I'm from Open, uh, Open Education Faculty. It's a faculty of Anadolu University uh, because I will mention Anadolu University is a dual mode university and we uh, offer all of our distance programs under this uh, Open Education uh, system or faculty. Uh, I do a lot of projects. Uh, currently, uh, I'm working on uh, open education resources and MOOCs project in another university, and also chairing the distance education department uh, here. Uh, I also um, have some connection with the EADTU, European uh, Association for Distance Teaching Universities. 
uh, especially I am in the steering committee of Open Up Ed Initiative, which is a sort of a, a MOOC aggregator. Uh, that means uh, we are trying to uh, bring and publicize all the MOOC, uh, MOOCs offered by the member uh, universities. Also, I work as a, uh, in the ICD, International Council for Distance Education, the OER's Advocacy Committee, uh, where we try to, uh, uh, try to uh, uh, sort of disseminate uh, uh, and uh, encourage people to use OERs, create OERs, share OERs. My research mainly focuses on, of course, open and distance learning, I do a lot of uh, study. Uh, I have some studies regarding MOOCs, OERs, and some other topics. But there is something I'm really proud of. Uh, I have two daughters, biologically two daughters, but I have 120 uh, daughters uh, who love to play basketball. I, I'm, I'm sort of a manager of this basketball, women basketball team. So I love and proud of doing it. Uh, so today what I'm going to do is I will just briefly introduce my institution and the, the situation regarding employ employability among our students. Then I will share some of my ideas, some of my experiences regarding employability, openness and education. Well, in Turkey, for those who, are, who don't know, we are like in the middle of everything. We have close ties with Europe, Asia. Africa, Russia, all other uh, countries, Middle East. And Tur uh, Eskisha, the city, the, my institution is located in the middle of uh, Turkey. Uh, so we, uh, we, are, we are able to reach everywhere. Uh, we call Eskisha, these are some pictures. Uh, it's a nice place. I always call it like an island in Anatolia. It's quite different, very liberal. Uh, nice views, you will allow it. Uh, I hope you, one day you will be able to visit it, us. It's sort of a college town. Uh, we have a lot of students. In fact, there are some distance students who do not have to come to the Eskisehir, but they love to come and uh, stay, live in Eskisehir because it's quite popular uh, and it's a nice place to live. In terms of Anadolu, my institution, uh, well, it started, uh, our roots goes back to 1958, sorry. But uh, in terms of distance education, we first offered in 82. We uh, plan to offer uh, or to only, we actually we targeted only 5,000 people, end up uh, providing education to 30,000 students. And since then, we are uh, offering uh, uh, distance education opportunity to, to millions. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, this is a, a dual mode university. So we have face-to-face -face education on campus students, like to, uh, 23,000 uh, students and uh, nearly 1.2 million distance students throughout all uh, country and all system. We have in our system, we have three colleges with the faculties uh, that are focusing on, uh, that are mainly providing distance education, uh, like Faculty of Open Education as the sort of flagship uh, faculty. Uh, under this, we have eight undergraduates, 41 uh, associate degree that mainly focus on vocational education. And in Faculty of Business and Administration, we have five undergraduate degrees and in Faculty of Economics, six. But the number of MOOCs is increasing. We have this Academia platform that I'm running, I'm directing right now. We have 120 MOOCs. I will come to that point, especially it is related to employability. And we have uh, around 30 uh, certificate programs and uh, many courses under those uh, certificate programs. Uh, as Anadolu University, we are offering the uh, Turkish people mainly in Turkish. We have a couple uh, other programs in English, but not on other languages. In terms of number of students currently, we have 1.1 and something. Uh, it's the large uh, body of students we have. This is uh, mainly the uh, major trend we have around like 
55, 54, 53, 52 males every year. You know, the number of students are changing. Actually, each semester they are changing. We have active and uh, passive students. Uh, but the, this ratio uh, has always been uh, almost the same. Uh, and in terms of age, you see we have a lot of uh, non-traditional students. I mean, uh, age 24 and older. Uh, see, currently, we have around like nine, more than 900,000 uh, 900, uh, students. Nearly 1 million students are, are actually non-traditional students. So from this point, we come to the, you know, the employability. But well, before employability, currently we have 3.5 million graduates. The gender ratio is almost the same. Uh, and we have uh, students all around uh, the world, actually. Uh, we, serve, we have students in uh, 39 countries, and we do in those countries we have uh, study and exam centers, uh, different uh, places, especially, for example, in the United States, we have five uh, centers uh, to be able to reach more students. Yes, in terms of employability, uh, I have to spend some time on this uh, graph. Uh, first of all, the blue. Uh, inter blue num the numbers and the explanations in blue. Uh, we have there are two major ways you can enter, you can enroll our programs or courses. The one is the university entrance exam. Uh, there is this national national centralized university entrance exam you have to take uh, as a graduate of high school to be able to get in a university. This percent is currently 33% of all our students uh, are coming through this, uh, through this um, way. But this was like during 80s, during 90s, it was more. It was like 70, 80% were coming through, maybe even 90% were coming through entering exams. Uh, and those, uh, the majority of those were traditional students. But uh, with the number of uh, number of traditional students increased, uh, this ratio, the way uh, this way, uh, the number of students coming through this way decreased. But then we had this opportunity, and we used the what we call second chance university or second university system. That means if you are a graduate of a university program, any program. It doesn't matter if it's online, it's a distance program or a face to face program. You can enter our programs, you can enroll our programs without taking any exams or anything. It doesn't matter uh, what uh, your grades are uh, or what you, what you did, how successful, successful you were in those programs. You can enter our programs without any. Uh, prerequisites, the sec except you have to have a degree or you must be um, a, a current student in another university, in a traditional or uh, online uh, distance uh, university program. And in terms of employment, majority of the students, since majority of our students are non-traditional students, they have already uh, jobs, they have some uh, they, Actually, I will come to that point also. 60% of both group have jobs. Doesn't matter if they are coming from university entrance exam or from, through the second chance, 60% of our students have already jobs. And this was an, the red one. It's actually uh, interesting. I just learned while preparing this uh, presentation for you, almost the same number of uh, different jobs uh, those two groups have, and now I'm, I'm analyzing if there are if there's any differences between the, those jobs. In fact, I have some figures. For example, we have a large number of teachers, public employees, engineers, accountants, uh, technicians, police officers, nurses. Uh, so this, these are the top ten 
but we have also all you see we, are, we have a lot of uh, students with different uh, from different uh, they have different occupations and in terms of overall you see uh, we have only 10 percent unemployed uh, students but uh, as you see uh, the number of students who are already studying somewhere is quite high around 25. We have some housewives, they don't, uh, well, actually it's a big job actually, it's a big occupation, but uh, they don't make money. <laughs> so when you uh, count those, you see 60% of those, our students are employed, 40% uh, uh, is not. So, uh, but then why they are coming to our programs? First, promotion. Majority of them coming uh, to get a promotion in their jobs. Some of them are coming for professional development. They want to learn more about what they are doing. For example, there's this deputy minister, I will talk, uh, introduce him. Uh, he just graduated with our program. He's a deputy minister, but he want to uh, learn more uh, in terms of uh, international relations because of his job. And there are, we have a lot of students for the per personal development. Uh, I will uh, give you another example, another student, another recent graduate from another program. Uh, he also came for just to fulfill his professional or personal development goals. And we have some, uh, not many, but we have some, to, uh, they want to get a better job. They want to switch their jobs, uh, get better one, uh, or they want to have jobs. Unfortunately, unemployment rate is not good in Turkey in general, as a country-wise. Uh, so uh, people are looking for ways to improve their skills to be able to get a job. Um, I must say that, for example, in second chance, uh, majority of the engineering students who are studying in different engineering uh, programs uh, often come to our uh, business management programs to be able to sort of have a, a second uh, degree in business management so that they can uh, get better jobs in the, in, in the companies. In terms of curriculum development, I added this part uh, because it's also related to employment. And this is sort of a, a general procedure we follow. You may have a program idea and curriculum idea, and then you have to do an analysis of uh, the, the, that idea, uh, if we can have enough students, if it's going to worth to offer this program, and then we start developing uh, the curriculum. But at these two stages, we work uh, we work very closely with the with the uh, sectors, with the uh, companies, uh, uh, with the external uh, partners, to be able to uh, ensure that we will have students and the graduates of our students uh, will be able to uh, you know benefit from having this uh, degree especially they will have some, they will be able to uh, find a job. They will be uh, employed. Then the process continues. So this is our, what we do. And in terms of our uh, curriculum development, is competencies, identifying the competencies is very important. In fact, it's legally, uh, you know, we are in the blowing process. Uh, there is this ECTS system we have to follow. And in Europe, there's this European qualification framework and nationally we adopted that framework and now we have national qualification framework. And every program you offer in Turkey, in every university, you should have program qualification or outcomes based on those national uh, qualification frameworks. This is something I have been telling everybody. Uh, it was 2002, uh, you know, uh, First of all, there is no difference in terms of uh, our uh, distance uh, program graduates and traditional distance, uh, traditional uh, program graduates. So the degrees are same. There is no difference. 
but uh, we've been uh, criticized a lot in terms of the in terms of the employability skills that we are uh, in our programs. Uh, and it was 2002, especially, uh, there was this conference and the presenters were saying that, yes, you are providing really good education for students to help them acquire those, what I call vertical competencies or field dependent competencies, competencies related to their fields. But uh, you must improve the programs or the horizontal or field independent uh, competencies. Uh, those are the 21st century skills, for example. Employability skills are those horizontal ones that we have to uh, embed in every program. But it is hard, especially uh, in, uh, uh, through a distance education. Sometimes some of the competencies or helping students acquire those competencies is not easy. So that's why we have Academa. Academa, the idea uh, first actually came from the critics. Mm -hmm. Through Academa, as an as external uh, or as sort of extracurricular activities or learning opportunities, we started to offer some uh, short, uh, flexible uh, MOOCs, massive open online courses for our students. We target first of all our students, but uh, open it to everybody. Uh, through Academa, uh, we try to focus on those employability skills, like how to be successful in work life, especially when you are a new employee. Uh, how to you have to conduct a job interview. Uh, how to uh, prepare a, 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 a CV to be able to apply a job. Those are the one of the first, uh, some of the first uh, courses uh, we created. And uh, in our system, we have guided uh, study mode, which means we have really some uh, real professors offering those courses and interacting with the students, even though the large numbers are large. The second one is uh, the self study mode uh, where students can um, study whenever they want. So Academa is actually created for the uh, to help the st our students, distance students, to acquire some of those employability skills. In terms of reputation, uh, before we, we have to uh, differentiate pre-COVID period and post-COVID period. Uh, in the beginning, uh, before the COVID, um, the, um, there were mixed uh, ideas regarding distance education. Some really didn't believe the value of distance education and they felt that they, you, they, uh, they cannot teach every topic through distance education. Uh, and there were some uh, employers who are even in their, uh, in their um, announcements for the new employees, uh, they were indicating that they don't want uh, graduates of distance education programs. Uh, so, but those, uh, those employers and employees or those individuals who once entered the system, who tested the uh, distance learning and teaching, they, real, they were uh, realizing that actually it is not different than any other. This is Actually, this is a, the results of a, of a study we conducted about the reputation. So once as open universities can grab the attention of the students and bring them into the system, they develop positive ideas. They, positive, uh, they develop positive uh, attitudes. And after COVID and during COVID actually, the K-12 didn't really perform well and it increased the uh, sort of uh, negative thoughts uh, regarding uh, distance education in K-12 settings. But on the other hand, in higher education, majority of the people uh, saw that they can teach online, they can teach at a distance any topic they want if you have the right design. So especially in non-formal, informal and corporate, uh, corporate learning, 
N plus in higher education, it really increased. Uh, my, um, my time is uh, short, I guess. Yes, sir. Two minutes. Yes, yes. Uh, this is the deputy minister. He actually graduated as a per person from our sociology program. But then after he became the deputy minister, the uh, minister of transportation and infrastructure, he realized that he needed more skills in terms of uh, international relations. So he graduated our international relations program and he's very happy about it. And uh, this is the, these are the scenes from the, our graduation ceremony this year. And this is the rector, president of another university. Uh, he's actually uh, an education specialist, but he wanted to improve, uh, well, he, for the personal development reasons, he was very interested in uh, sociology. So he graduated, graduated our sociology program. And you see the six people, uh, the one on the very left part, uh, he's currently our students. You know, uh, Apple organizes this uh, sort of a challenge, Swift student challenge, and he's one. Uh, he's one of our students in our uh, web design uh, program, uh, web design and coding program, and uh, he's among those six students from Turkey will join uh, to this uh, challenge. Uh, he's a very successful uh, coder. So. Here's my ideas. First of all, as traditional distance education providers, we have to move to completely online digital distance education. Competencies are very important. We have to focus on so that people can get employment. But there is the issue. Actually, this is more important than I can spend hours about it. Unfortunately, uh, in higher education, there is a big tendency uh, the tie between employment and education got really tight. It's very strong. But we have to think about the, yes, we have to think about uh, those employability uh, and we have to, while designing our programs, we have to focus on, or we have to help students uh, get uh, an employment. This is uh, for sure. For this, we have to have some programs, sort of career ready, career ready uh, education, but that must be flexible. We have to offer those MOOCs, certificate programs uh, for their careers. They don't have to study four years, two years. Uh, they don't have to spend that much time. We have to provide flexible work. But at the same time, we should not forget our, the roots of university education. Uh, we have to have really um, uh, solid programs uh, in the mainstream fields uh, for the sake of university education. Uh, those are just my ideas. Actually, I would like to spend more about this, but I hope this gives an idea regarding uh, my institution, uh, employability position and of our students and and, uh, and what we can do in terms of um, in terms of open universities for the employment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sengis Hakan Aydin. Again, uh, we picked up a lot of insights from your presentation. In my case, particularly, what I noted was for our webinar participants, particularly the students. In Dr. Genghis's presentation, what he's actually showing is that ODL is an opportunity that you need to take advantage of because it unlocks possibilities for you. Now, how much of those possibilities will work for you actually depends on you. Because ODL, such as those of the Anadolu University, basically what they're providing is access, access to industry-based programs, well thought of programs, such as the ones discussed by our distinguished speaker. Uh, programs that are aligned with local, uh, national, and international competency frameworks. Um, it, uh, it is not limited or bounded by geographical boundaries. So again, these are opportunities for you, not bounded by age. And, uh, and even if you already have a job, you can still study for continuing professional development to move up to your career ladder. All these opportunities presented to you by the ODL. So again, thank you. Thank you very much to our speakers. We will now open the floor for the 
uh, questions from our webinar participants. We will be pulling up the series of questions that we have gathered from the Zoom as well as from the live stream. So may we now see the questions? I'm sure a lot of our participants have been wondering, okay, I will be reading out the question and then uh, we'll give our, uh, our speakers the opportunity to respond to them. So first question, and this is for Mr. Kamran Mir. The question is coming from Ahmad Bilal of the UT Palembang. The question is, it is challenging for students of vocation programs through ODL system. Did you experience this, th this kind of struggling? And do you think you get appropriate learning or experiences for the practice courses you take? So I believe that the question intends to, to, to ask about the challenges for students in vocation programs. Sir Kamran, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Yes, uh, this, uh, it's very challenging as well uh, because uh, some of the vocational, I think it is very difficult to get uh, the experience online. Definitely, again, uh, pointing to my point of view, uh, along with your ODL studies, you it is very good approach if you get the chance to work in a real environment. Especially in our university, we were like giving vocational programs through television as well. Uh, there were different practical exercises as well for uh, like uh, teaching how to repair uh, even car, even how to repair uh, an, an, uh, a radio, some very old programs. But still, if we, uh, as, as a student, only ODL, only learning will not like help. As an, in, as an institution, institution should like make such policies so that some practical aspect is also included. So that the student also goes to the industry or the nearby industry or the nearby any practical industry where he can perform the relevant task as well as a, as, a, as a task. And as a student, if there is no opportunity from institution, as a student, if you really want to learn, you should see around your, like, uh, see around, uh, around you, around in, in your city, in your country, or anywhere in the world where you can perform that learning. So if you work together with the learning, I think, that will uh, ease your challenge and that will ease you in learning as well. Thank you very much, Sir Kamran. So when we say all the other, we don't mean just do it purely online. It's a way you, you can search for things that can augment whatever learning you gain uh, in either of the modalities, whether face-to-face -face or online. So next question, please. Okay, this time for Ma'am Angelina Chong, the question is from each son of the Ministry of Transportation, Republic of Indonesia. How do you build motivation to be enjoyable in learning during the pandemic? As we know that we face online learning by Zoom or other platforms, sometimes there's a feeling of boredom. So what would be your advice on how our students can best face this, ma'am? Thank you, Iksan. Um, I, I do agree with you. Um, <clears throat> you see, when we had this transition from uh, the traditional you know, learning to the online learning, I, I, felt, I felt lost because uh, I'm a very physical person. I, I like the physical interaction. I like the eye contact. I like to be, <clears throat> you know, I like to be able to speak to a person and look at their face, read their, their, their um, you know, nonverbal communications and all. So I, I was very lost. I was very bored. I hated it. And then <clears throat> I realized that, well, you know, I, I can't go on hating. I have to adapt. I have to be flexible, and and this is what uh, this is what leadership is all about in this dynamic world. We have to be very flexible in order for us to catch up. So what I did was, um, you see, building a motivation is the the basic the foundation of your character must be there. You know, you must be a motivated person to believe in yourself and to be um, motivated to be driven. You see, one thing I learned from. Uh, the course that I took from this BMPS course that I took from WOU is the uh, uh, Maya Briggs personality test, uh, MBTJ. Uh, <clears throat> go and take, go and go for it, Google for it, go for the Maya Briggs test, all right? 
perform that test honestly, they will give you a, you know, a four letter that actually explains what is your character, what is your personality about. I did that, you know, that's part of my assignment. That's why I love this WOU. The assignments they do is just so, you know, enlightening. It's so eye-opening kind of thing. And I did it and I read it and I'm like, oh my God, I'm like that? Really? And I... I, I internalized. It made me internalize. And yes, I am like that. And how can I change myself? How can I be better? Or how can I make use of that quality that I have to my greater advantage? And it motivated me. So do the Maya Briggs test. Uh, see where is your motivation level. Another thing is during online learning, which we all go through at the moment, talk. Uh, interrupt. Uh, I, I always interrupt my lecturers. I always stop them and tell them like, uh, excuse me, I have a question. You know, that's why I love I love uh, lecturers who would entertain me. There's some lecturers who tells me like, Angie, can you leave your question right at the end? And I say, no, no, I can't. Because if I were to allow you to go all the way to the end and I do not understand the beginning, how am I supposed to understand the middle and the end? So you must explain what is this. That's why in my earlier um, sharing, I said that Understanding is very important. You must understand in order to enjoy it. You must be able to find humor. And I would always interrupt my lecturers and I would be teasing them. I would I will make sure that all my lecturers smile. And, and you know, the moment somebody smiles, that's 10% in your hands. So find humor, interact, get people to start talking. You know, talking actually makes it more fun because otherwise you'll fall asleep. So I'm always asking questions. Ask and ask and you will definitely find it very interesting and you will somehow develop the internal motivation that's why internal motivation is super important the next because external motivation can fade when your external rewards cease but internal motivation will never fade it will grow and develop and it would be able to give you some external motivation as well so build that within you first and you will be able to see it in your actions when you attend your online learning I hope that answers you. Thank you very much, ma'am. Very much on point. And also, be comfortable with the uncomfortable. So next question, please. Okay, this time for Professor Genghis Akalai Dean. The question is from John Wang of Singapore. Sir, it is interesting to know your life activity, sound balance. Please share your ideas on how to align optimally between the courses that the students take and the job market. How does the university, Anadolu, concern with students or alumnus' jobs and careers? Sir? Uh, yes. Um, well, uh, what we do is, again, uh, uh, during the program development or course development, we uh, work closely with the, uh, with the possible employers. And we try to uh, help them what kind of students we, have, we try to explain them, what kind of students or graduates we will have at the end. Uh, and that's the major actually uh, and most effective way to help, uh, to help students um, uh, to get jobs. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we have a, a, ca a career center in our uh, system uh, for those uh, who would like to improve their uh, skills and who would like to get jobs. Uh, not, it's not job placement center. It's just a recommendation center for the students. Those who are looking for uh, employees can come to this center uh, in our uh, institution and also those who are looking for jobs. Uh, and we just recommend uh, some uh, opportunities uh, for both groups. But I must say that uh, it's a tough job and we are not really uh, doing a great job about that. That's why um, that's another uh, big actually topic uh, uh, or the, the, the concept unbundling. As open universities, we cannot really do everything well. So what we are recommending to our institutions, administrators, is that we have to work with the uh, professional 
job placement centers uh, to be able to meet those uh, students and uh, students who are looking for jobs. So we have to have some strategic partners to be able to do it. But currently we are doing it, we are trying to do it, but I must say that we are not really good at doing it. On the other hand, uh, since majority of our students have already jobs, it's not a very big issue currently for us. Uh, I don't know if this answered the question. Thank you very much, Sir Genghis. I really understand your position because in a way we are the same as far as institutions are concerned. We begin with the end in mind. So where do we want all of these efforts to go as far as uh, our students are concerned and we're very glad to also note that you have thought of you know providing the support services to the students and i do understand that uh, higher education institutions sometimes even if it's not our area of expertise but we need to try as this is part of the overall picture in supporting and helping out our students all right we go to the next question okay this time so anybody can answer from among our speakers from Joko Isbianto of UT Jember. How do you overcome the learning environment disturbance? So when learners are learning via online, most of our students are not focusing. So there's some disruptions in terms of their concentration. So what would be your advice to our online learners? Again, anybody can answer from our speakers. Sir Kamran, would you like to be the first? Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, uh, disturbance cannot be removed 100%. Whether it is online learning, whether it is a face-to-face -face learning, disturbance is in the life, definitely. You cannot uh, make the things 100% okay. So that's, the, uh, that's how the life works. But how we can overcome the disturbance is that I think uh, in the online, uh, we have to focus on the interest of the student. Because if we, if we just follow the teaching strategy which we were doing in a face-to-face -face and we just uh, upload the presentation or, or make it one-sided, it, it, it will make boring for the student and definitely it will detract or he will like, uh, uh, become out of focus. To, to make him focus, I think we should uh, uh, focus on the interest of the student. If the student as a whole, um, they are more interested towards games and they are more interested, just like Angie told, you uh, the session should be interactive. When, when you will involve the student, when you will give them the ownership of the content and give them the task according to their interest, especially uh, if you're giving uh, as a teacher as well. And, uh, and as the technology is uh, like emerging day by day, the use of artificial intelligence and use of automated systems, uh, they, uh, people are working on it and uh, automated proctoring system. So I think uh, by uh, that after some time, uh, there, will, there will be like uh, those LMS, those kind of learning management system, which are like uh, AI based intelligent and they are like adapting uh, the learning content according to the learner, personalized learning. So I think uh, this will uh, reduce not it cannot like 100% eliminate but it, it can reduce the disturbance because disturbance uh, is uh, is a fact, factual thing and uh, you have you can reduce it by uh, keeping the interest level of the student uh, in mind uh, whether it is a teacher or whether it is a system all right thank you very much sir how about sir gang who is a kind idea sir yes um, we we did this study uh, for some years, try to learn the uh, learning patterns of the students, successful students. And we found out that uh, time management is the key. So as institutions, first of all, you have to have orientation and you have to help students to develop their time management skills. We are, uh, I personally recommend all of my, st all the students, all the distance students that they should spend only just 10 minutes every day, nothing more, not every single second more, just 10 minutes to, for their uh, courses. And it will be enough for, of course, for every course, 10 minutes. Uh, it will be enough for them. Uh, if they can really manage time, they can overcome all the disturbances. 
uh, they don't have to, uh, we, what we tell them is just uh, identify a time period. You will spend this 10 minutes or 15 minutes just on the topic you, they have to study all the activities they have to complete. Uh, but uh, they should not be very uh, strict on those time uh, period. Uh, if they have a disturbance, they, sh must, they should be able to change it to another time. They have to be flexible. But again, I mean, really the time management and planning, making plans and uh, following those plans uh, are the best part. Plus, there is one thing in our orientations we are really focusing on is what Angie mentions a lot, uh, which is making learning as a fun activity rather than just completing a task. So we always tell them that just have fun, you know, this is a fun activity. Maybe you're not uh, understanding what you are watching or listening or reading, but it's okay, make fun of it and provide feedback uh, about it uh, and in a funny way so that we can try to fix it. So those are my ideas about that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sergey Genghis. Now, Mom, Angie? Yes, I do have something to say about this. So this is from a student's perspective, yeah? And um, how do you make it interesting? from uh, a person who's, who's lecturing. I, you know, it, during the traditional uh, class, there's always eye contact and, and you keep your eye contact in order to catch them so that they keep on looking at you and they won't fall asleep. But now that we are, we're going to that online learning process and you cannot keep eye contact because you don't know whose eyes are looking at you. So what is to me, what is very, very important is your intonation, your tone of voice. If I were to talk like this and uh, you're not going to listen to me and uh, we're going to, you know, you're not going to listen. You're going to fall asleep right there, smack on your laptop. But intonation is very important. You must know when to raise your voice. You know when to pause. You know when to place emphasis. And, you know, it captures people. It plays with your mind. It, it, it plays with your brain cells and it wakes you up. And intonation is very important. Body language is very important. Hand gestures, not too much. It gets annoying. Facial expressions. All these things are very, very important because people want to, People want to. People are looking at you, and people want to see that. Um, you know, you know what, what is she gonna be coming up to next time? And also, it's like teaching is also like giving speeches. Uh, you must have your catchphrase. You must have an eye. Uh, you must have an opening that actually captures you. You you come up with something very silly, you know, and then people would go like, oh, what's that? You know, and and it's like. And then you start explaining, and then they'll start smiling because you know it's it's something very silly. So. As an educator, um, I think that you, you, you don't expect your class to be fun. You don't expect Angie to be sitting there and trying to create chaos in your class all the time because it, like in, in, my, in my country, or I think in a lot of countries, a lot of students are uh, they're very passive. They are just waiting for people to, to give them handouts and all. And not a lot of people would actually be proactive and, and, and go for it, you know? So you cannot wait for students to, to actually be proactive about things. So you play a role as well to insert your humor, to insert your uh, fun bit through your intonation and through your body language. And that's what I think. Because I look at my son's teachers, you know, he's doing online learning. And I look at the teachers, even I would fall asleep just looking at it. And he spends like the whole day there online class. So, yeah. That's how I feel on a student's perspective on how we can make learning fun. Thank you. Thank you, Mom Angie. Sir Genghis, do you want to add something? Yes, actually, uh, respond to Angie's uh, phrase, um, you know, creating students with creating uh, chaos. Actually, we love that kind of students because, uh, you know, interaction is the key. And if you have a, what we call alpha student, like you, Angie, uh, try to create problems or try to, you know, lead the students. We love those. Those are the ones who help us actually make the uh, sessions in the synchronous, even in, in the synchronous part, fun. So um, please, uh, oh, I recommend everybody to be, a, you know, uh, like Angie. We love as instructors to have Angie kind of students. 
Yes, I guess on the part of our faculty, you know, you always want to be challenged because it brings out the best in you. And so for our students, challenge doesn't necessarily, being challenging doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean you're trying to disrupt, you know, and, and it has to be in, in the right place, you know, coming from, from a good intention. Uh, at this point, may I just ask our, I'd like to take this opportunity to ask again our speakers, anybody again can answer so the world today is often described as a VUCA world, yeah? volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And you know, we often also hear that students are currently preparing for jobs which may possibly be not here yet, no? something jobs that we don't know yet, no? doesn't exist yet. Within your respective areas of expertise, what insights or advice can you give to our students for them to be able to adapt to the current VUCA world. So again, anybody can answer from our speakers. I must go, uh, I can go first. Go ahead, sir. Uh, yeah, uh, actually I try to answer this question in my presentation. You remember the vertical and horizontal skills. Doesn't matter what field, uh, what's the topic or what's the focal point of your study. Uh, you have to have some skills uh, that you should, uh, you must actually possess uh, uh, those employability skills. And one of those skills are the, uh, one of those skills is uh, learn more, be open to changes. So uh, as students, uh, you must uh, try to acquire those, uh, what I call horizontal or field independent or 21st century skills, whatever you call it. But you should have that kind of skills, like openness to everything, uh, trying to uh, open to learning, improving yourself. That's the key, I think. And the topic you are studying is not really that important for me. The most important part is uh, what kind of those horizontal skills you are uh, acquiring. And you should focus on that. And as institutions, we should also uh, focus on helping students uh, to acquire those kind of skills that will help them uh, find different jobs that we don't know right now. Uh, or uh, they will have, uh, you know, different perspectives about they will have maybe our students will create new jobs but in order to be able to uh, sort of facilitate that process we have to help them as institutions to acquire those horizontal or whatever you call it that kind of skills not just the, the topic or the program related ones thank you Thank you very much, Regendius. Perhaps one more response from our, any of our speakers? No more, all right. So that's about the time that we have for the question and answer portion. Thank you very much to our dear speakers and also thank you for our webinar participants who uh, brought us in their questions. It's really been an interesting and learning experience. So now turning over to our main host. All right, thank you very much. You know, uh, to be honest, I would like to tell you that this is one of the best, uh, or one of the most I like very much, uh, the AOU Web uh, Student Inspiration. I am very sure that all participants learn a lot from our today discussion. Once again, I thank you very much to uh, Ms. Joan and then our uh, distinguished speakers uh, and uh, Mr. Kamran Mir, uh, Mr. Joan, and then Professor Chengis, and also to our uh, moderator who lead our discussion uh, very interesting today. And before we start, I would like to uh, remind you that in the next uh, inspiration, we are going to invite uh, uh, 
some outstanding speaker and then if you who are listening to this and or watching this uh, webinar if you would like to participate as a both speaker for example or as a moderator please do not hesitate to contact the aou secretariat and then uh, before we end our uh, program i would like to invite all of you to turn on the camera and let us take picture uh, together as a or set a memento for our today uh, webinar please and then our uh, staff from uh, AOE Secretariat will uh, or set uh, take the picture by counting one, two, three, and then please, uh, Ayubi, Philip, you lead the, the session. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Ahmad. Okay, guys, so get ready to take a picture together now for the first page one, two, three. Okay. okay, the next page now, please open your camera, make sure everyone's opening the camera. I can still see some hasn't opened it. Page two now, one, two, three. And the last page now, one, two, three. All right, thank you very much. Yes. All right. Thank you, Ayu. Okay, the participant. Once again, thank you for participating our today uh, student inspiration. The second student inspiration. Uh, please uh, be alert that uh, our next uh, AOU web uh, student inspiration webinar will be in December. Please uh, write it in your uh, agenda, and that, that there are some information you need to uh, pay attention uh, in this uh, in the next uh, five or ten minutes so uh, read the uh, uh, announcement from the secretariat from the committee and once again to moderator and the speakers i thank you very much i really appreciate your contribution to the aou once again, thank you and keep uh, healthy. And then uh, let us hope that uh, in the next year, we will meet in person in Jeju Island during the AOU uh, conference. Thank you and have a nice day. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.